I'd like to welcome you to track one. This is Trust, Security, and Society with Bruce Schneier. Hey there, I just went next door because it's kind of noisy there. I was wondering what they were doing. But the, the part of the air wall back there is, is not there, and that's why we, uh, we're hearing them. So I'll try to talk loud. We'll try to ignore them, and uh, all should go well. So hi, good morning. Thanks for coming. Thanks for, for staying and listening. Uh, I want to talk about uh, trust in society and security. I kind of want to talk about, a, you know, my career has been an endless series of generalizations, and, and this, this talk, which is also sort of my latest book, is my attempt to continually understand security, how it works, and really why it exists. I mean, why is it that we have security and, and rocks don't? I mean, it seems kind of a dumb question, but I think if you start thinking about it, you understand more about how security works, why it works, and how we can do it better. And this got me to thinking about trust and the role of trust in society and the role of security in making trust work. So let's think about trust for, for just for a moment. Right? You know, this morning I wake up in a hotel room, right, a building I don't own, of which you know, about hundreds of people in that building have a copy of my room key. And I go downstairs, I, I eat breakfast prepared by chefs I don't know, any one of them who can poison me. I get in a taxi cab to come here, a, a huge right, exercise in trust. I'm being driven around in this deadly vehicle with other deadly vehicles. You know, walk through the casino floor and, and nobody attacks me. I mean, here we are, you know, a room full of strangers. I mean, and this you know, takes an extra, extra meaning a week after the, uh, the shootings in Aurora. Right? You know, most of the time, all of the time, this works. Right? Society works. There's an enormous amount of trust. We trust thousands of times a day, probably more if you add up everything in, in, in the global supply chain. And it works. I, mean, I drank a bottle of water this morning. That's an exercise in trust. And, and if you think about trust that way, you just see it everywhere. And, of course, we know that occasionally that trust is misplaced, right? Taxi drivers in Las Vegas occasionally cheat their customers, <laughs> right? Probably more if you pick them up at the airport. They, sometimes they cheat just a little. I mean, I, I know the, the Las Vegas trick for cabbies at the airport is to take you around via the highway. Adds about $10 to your fare, nobody knows, and it's a minor way of cheating. Right? A bigger way of cheating happened to a friend of mine in Italy about 10 years ago. Uh, a cabbie drove him to a, a deserted part of, of Rome and, and demanded a big, you know, a big payment. And he was big and burly. Right? So trust is essential to society. And we as a species are naturally trusting. I mean, even us who are the paranoids are naturally trusting. We are all sitting here, a room full of strangers, and not one of us has turned to attack the person sitting next to them. Right? You all laugh, but if we were a species of chimpanzees, this would be impossible. Right? Humans are the only animal that can get away with doing this. Humans are the only animal that trust at the scale we do. Right? We trust thousands of times today, uh, each day, and society can't function without that level of trust. Society would collapse. Right? We would never have cities. We would never have technology. We would never have nation states. We would never have black hats. And the fact that we do it without even thinking about it, that you had breakfast this morning and it never even occurred to you, I'm trusting some guy not to poison me. It never occurred to you. That's a measure of how good it is, right? Of how, how pervasive and how natural that trust is in our society today. So this is a talk about trust, about trust in society. It's a way of thinking about society and it's a way of thinking about society's problems. And my hope is that this way of thinking about society will shed light 
on some of society's problems, especially for us as security people. Right? Because as the security people deal with maintaining the trust and what we do when it's broken. And really this talk distills my latest book. Right? Liars and Outliers, for sale at the bookstore, right? forget the price. So what I want to talk about is how we enable trust, how security enables trust. Right, so it's less a talk about why trust is important. A lot of people write about that. I'm hoping it's obvious. And more a talk about how we make it work, right? how we induce it, right? how security enables trust. It's also largely a talk about group interest versus self-interest and how the group enforces its interest. Right? It might be in your self-interest to attack the person sitting next to you. Maybe he's got something nice you want. But it's in all of our interest that nobody does that. How do we as a group stop individuals in the audience from taking advantage of us? Okay, so, so trust is a complicated concept. You know, security also, security is one of those words that's really hard to, to encapsulate because there's so many meanings. And the hardest part of, of, often of writing my books is, is when the, the art director comes up with book cover ideas because they're all stupid. <laughs> because, you know, it's a security camera, it's barbed wire. I mean, all, I, mean, I mean, security is such an overloaded metaphor that everything seems trite. Trust is like that too. It's a very overloaded word. It has a lot of different meanings. You know, and sort of broadly, um, you know, in one way of thinking about it is there are two types of trust. There's a personal to intimate trust. You trust your friend, your spouse, a family member. You know, and when, you, when I say I trust a friend, I'm not really talking about specific things they do. I'm talking about them as a person. Right? It's not that I, I trust that they will behave in a certain manner, but I, I sort of trust that they will think about things a certain way. I know them enough to know how they will think, and I know those thoughts will inform their actions. I'm not trusting what they do, I'm trusting who they are. It's kind of not the trust I'm talking about here. I mean, I didn't know the taxi driver this morning. I had no idea who he was. I had no idea of his motivations. He could be a bank robber at night, right? All I wanted is him to get me to Caesars in you know, 10 minutes and charge me $10, which he did. And that's more the kind of trust that makes society work, right? We don't know them personally. We're tr I'm doing I'm trusting his actions. I'm trusting that he, in the role of a cab driver, will behave in a trustworthy manner within that role. So it's, it's nothing about his motivations. It's nothing about who he is. It's about what he's going to do in the next five minutes, ten minutes. And, and maybe trust is a bad word. I'm really talking about confidence here. Uh, maybe he's not really being trustworthy. He's being compliant. In a lot of ways, I'm reducing trust to predictability, to consistency. Right? When I go and check in the hotel, and then the, the, uh, the front desk agent takes my credit card, right? I'm, I'm trusting that she will behave in a predictable manner, right? She will use that credit information to charge my hotel room and not an expensive vacation to Aruba. So when people behave this way, right, the taxi driver, the front desk clerk, all of you, I I'm calling that cooperative. Right? We're behaving in a cooperative manner. Right? We're following the social norm. We're doing what's expected. We're not breaking trust. So in today's society, uh, we are all expected to trust people, that's kind of obvious, but also institutions and systems. And I think this is an interesting abstraction. You know, I, I flew here on Tuesday, and I trusted that the pilot would get me here without crashing. But actually, I really didn't trust the pilot. I trusted Delta Airlines that has a set of procedures that produce competent and well-slept pilots, right, that they will populate in airplanes in some reasonable manner such that 
the system will work. Right? I trusted the company. I didn't really trust the taxi driver at the airport, but the system that produced him. Right? There's licensing requirements in, in Nevada. I don't know what they are. There's some system that they queue up and get passengers. Right? They, they, I'm not taking a gypsy cab on a, on a side street. Right? There, there's, there's a whole system that produces them. Right, you know, this morning, I, I, you know, it's a really bizarre system. I take this plastic card, put it in a machine, punch some buttons, get cash, right, American money, trusting implicitly that a similar amount, minus a heinous fee, right, will be debited from my account back in Minneapolis. I trust this system even if I'm in China. Right? So there's some international banking system that I don't even understand, but I'm trusting it. And that's the sort of trust I'm talking about. Okay, so cooperation. All complex systems require cooperation. Actually, you just say all complex ecosystems require cooperation. This is true for biological ecosystems, this is true for social ecosystems, and this is true for socio technical systems. They all require cooperation of some sort. To make black hat work, we all have to cooperate. Right? To make movie going experiences work, we all have to cooperate. But in any cooperative system, there is also an alternative parasitic strategy. Right? In any system of cooperators, there is a non cooperative strategy that is also successful. Right? And these could be tapeworms in your digestive tract. These could be thieves in a medieval market. These could be spammers on email. These could be companies that take their profits offshore to evade taxes. Right? Very broadly speaking, there's always this uncooperative strategy. And using game theory, I'm going to call those people defectors. Right? And those of you who know some game theory can hear echoes of the prisoner's dilemma in what I'm talking about. And in fact, the prisoner's dilemma is a central metaphor I use to talk about this. Because that really nicely encapsulates the problem of self-interest versus group interest. Right? This is, people don't know, the prisoner's dilemma is a thought experiment where individuals decide whether they should cooperate or defect. Their decisions affect the other, but their decisions can't influence the other. So these parasites, Parasites can survive in an ecosystem if they're not too successful. This is important. If the number of detect defectors gets too large, the system collapses. The number of defectors in society gets too large, the systems collapse. Right? If tapeworms get too greedy, you die and they die. Too many thieves in the medieval market, the market collapses and thieves starve. Right, too much spam on email. Everyone says, I don't read email anymore. There's too much spam. And email stops being an effective mechanism to send spam. Right, if too many people don't pay their taxes, the government stops functioning. So the parasitic strategy is one that has to be dialed kind of precisely. It can't get too big. And those who, who do this kind of know it. Right, the mafia, who, who, are, who are sort of masters at parasitic strategies, know there's only so much money you can demand for protection. You demand too much, the business goes out, it goes out of business, and it doesn't work. Right, so there's always this fundamental tension between cooperating and defecting. I mean, we as individuals versus us as society. Because if you think about it, right, we might individually want each other's stuff, but we are all better off if nobody steals. Right? We might individually not want to pay for government, but we are all better off if everyone does. Right? I mean, you look at the collapse in Greece. That really happened because people stopped paying their taxes. Government collapsed. And, and sort of more to the point, well, we're all better off if everyone cooperates but us. Right? You know, I'm better. I want to steal because I get your stuff. 
I'm better off living in a society where no one steals because that's a better society to live in, but I'm really better off if I live in a society where no one steals and I steal. Right? I get the benefits of living in a cooperative society and the benefits of being a defector. But of course, if everyone thinks that way, the system collapses. That's the prisoner's dilemma. Now, for most of us, this is not a dilemma. Most of us realize this most of the time. Right? Most of us realize that it's in our long-term best interest not to act in our short-term best interest. But of course, not everyone does. And that's why society needs security. Right? Security is how we, as a group, keep the number of defectors down to an acceptable minimum. And, and note that acceptable minimum isn't zero. Right? The goal is not to have zero defectors. The goal is to have some minimum level that society still functions. Right? So security is how we induce cooperation. This in turn induces trustworthiness and this in turn induces trust. Right? We are able to trust in society because we know that security is keeping the compliance level, but the cooperation level high enough. So this is very abstract. I'm really giving a very abstract theory of security. Notice I'm not making any claims about the moral stance of society or the defectors. Right? These, these mechanisms work for groups to enforce norms. It could be a group, a community of citizens. It could be a community of criminals. It could be some immoral society. It could be how the group enforces slaveholding. Right? The mechanisms are going to be the same. We know this from security, right? Security helps, keep, helps the good guys and the bad guys. As security people, we cannot build mechanisms that only do good because they only secure whatever the underlying thing is. The underlying thing could be morally good or bad. Right? So these are basic security mechanisms. So what I'm thinking about is what are these mechanisms? What are the mechanisms by which we as a society, we as a group, all groups, induce trust? And I call these mechanisms societal pressures because they really are pressures. They influence the decision. Right? They, they, they modify your trade-off. You're deciding whether or not to steal. And I'm looking for ways that we as a group affect that decision process. <coughs> All right, so the, so the, the first one is what I'm calling morals. And by morals, I mean very generally anything that happens inside your head that affects whether you cooperate or defect. Right? A lot of us, I mean, a lot of societal pressure comes from inside our own heads. Most of us in the world don't steal, not because of laws or because of combination locks, but because we know it's wrong. Right? If we steal, we feel bad. This is interesting. Right? Feeling bad, where did that come from? Right? That comes from in our heads. Right? The belief that stealing is wrong, the desire to be fair, all of these things. These are security mechanisms because they keep most people honest, cooperative, conforming. You know, and once you start looking at this, there's a combination of, of cultural and innate factors. There's a lot of great neuroscience research on some of these things. You know, and, and it really does feel like a lot of these are, are hardwired in our brains because we are a cooperative species. Uh, the second one of these I call reputation. Reputation is interesting. Reputation is, is anything where we worry about how others feel. And this is very informal. I mean, this is another type of societal pressure. And, and it has to do with how others respond to our actions. Right? We get praised for good behavior. We get snubbed for bad behavior. Right? In extreme cases, we get expelled. 
Right? I mean, if a, fr- if a friend steals my sweater, I'm making this up. I'm not going to call the police. I'm just not going to invite them over anymore. Right? You know, if one of you people, you know, I don't know, jumps up and attacks your neighbor, we're probably not going to call the police. We'll expel you from Black Hat. You, you don't get to come to DEF CON. Right? That's a pretty big deal. I mean, we as a community can enforce our social norms simply by watching each other, not, not spying on each other, but you know, being aware of who's around us. Hey, we don't do that here. Some things we do here, I mean, we sniff passwords, that's just the way we are. But some things we don't do, right? Like, like you know, jump our neighbor in the middle, or something even weirder. I mean, I mean there's a weird social norm here, right? You know, I get to talk and you don't. Seems kind of unfair. But if one of you jumped up and started talking or singing, we we get you out of the room because that's not what we're doing here. There's time for that later. <laughs> right? And reputation's a big deal. We are very, as a species, we are extraordinarily sensitive about reputation information. We we guard and groom our reputations is incessantly. Right? We, we know about the reputation of others. We watch our own reputation. I mean, there's a really interesting theory that language, that we as a species develop language to trade reputational information. And this is a big deal. Other species do reputation. Our primates. Primates will remember other individuals and know if they're good or bad or if they, you know, I mean, what they're like. We are the only species that can transfer reputation information. Right? I can tell you about him. No other primate can do, no other creature can do that. Right? Transferring reputational information is huge. Right? It means we can know things about people not through direct observation. It means our reputation can scale. There's a great experiment uh, looking at how people it, it's, it's about reputation. It's kind of neat. This is, it was done in a university psychology, psychology department. And the psychology department had a coffee urn and an honesty box. The basic idea is you take a cup of coffee, you put a quarter in the box. And you can measure people's cooperation here. Right? You measure the amount of coffee drunk, you count the money, and I can tell you what percentage of people pay. So what the experimenters did, this is kind of great, they put a photograph of a pair of eyes behind the coffee pot. Right? And that increased people's payment considerably. Just being reminded that someone might be watching makes people more honest. Sort of surprising, but kind of neat. So these two societal pressures, right, morals and reputation, are very old. In a lot of ways, I mean, by the way, there's old as human society. You see vestiges of them in, in other mammals, certainly in other primates, in any social species. And a lot of the brain structures where morality occurs in our brain, you can find in other, in other, other animals. You can stimulate them. You can make animals more or less moral. A lot of great research. Uh, I think of this as our primitive societal security toolkit. This is how we as society did security through most of our existence, through those two mechanisms and nothing else. Now, I mean, they're only okay because all you have to do is be a sociopath. You don't care what anyone else thinks. You don't have any morals. And, you know, you can do pretty well. And, and there's a lot of, uh, of work done on the value of sociopaths in primitive societies you know, and why that, that parasitic strategy evolved, right? I mean, uh, it's only like 1% of us, but it persists. Why did it persist? Because it has value. The problem with these is, is they don't scale very well. Because the real value of societal pressures for us is they allow society to scale. Right? Black Hat would be less fun if it was just a hundred of us. The fact that there are thousands, we need a lot more than morals and reputation to make sure that you all pay your, your admission fee and, and everyone does what they're supposed to do and no one steals from each other and we can, we can use a hotel and they'll, they'll take our money. I mean, all of the things to make Black Hat work requires society to scale. 
and primitive societal security mechanisms aren't good enough for that. Right? Larger communities require delegation. Right? A subset of us are in charge of making sure this all works. We have delegated management of Black Hat to some people who we are trusting to do it right. So we have rules and society has laws that effectively formalize reputation. Right? You know, systems get global. We start needing technologies. Right? Your badge is vaguely uh, uh, counterfeit proof. It's got a little hologram. Right? It, it's not completely counterfeit proof, but it's probably good enough. Right? There are locks to my hotel room door, which we've just learned aren't any good, but we used to think they were good. Right? To keep people out. Actually, have people checked, does their hotel room door have the uh, USB port? Who thinks their hotel room? Do people know this vulnerability? Yes, no? Well, you'll hear about it. It's, it's either was, was announced today or, or maybe in a couple, of week, uh, a couple of days at DEF CON. Someone found a really nice vulnerability in hotel room doors that allows someone to, to open them unreliably uh, without a key just by uh, going in through a, what looks like a maintenance port. So. so we as society have developed other types of security pressures. The third thing is I call institutional pressures. Right? As society scales, we have institutions. We have rules and laws. Right? These are social norms that have been codified and whose enforcement has been delegated. Right? Instead of me not inviting my friend over for he steals my sweater, right? if someone robs a bank, the bank doesn't say, well, look, you're no longer a customer. The bank calls the police turns out to be a more effective security mechanism. It's more expensive, but if society is going to scale, we need it. Right? Institutional pressures induce people to behave according to the social norms because there are sanctions if you don't. You go to jail. You are fined. Right? Occasionally there are rewards if you do, but primarily we work on sanctions. And the fourth mechanism is security systems. This is the stuff that, that we tend to be involved in. Right? Mechanisms that are designed to induce cooperation, prevent defection, induce trust, compel compliance, sort of any of those things. So you think about you know, door locks and toll fences right? that, that keep people from you know, going where they're not supposed to. Alarm systems and guards, right? response systems, forensic and audit systems, recovery systems, or mitigation systems. Right? These are all technical mechanisms of varying tech level. I mean, you can, you can look at the ones the Romans use, you can look at the ones that we use. Right? And they all also you know, change the equation when someone decides, should I steal or not? And all of these work together. And this is important. And this is why I think this is all important. Say this being just a bunch of fluff. I take stealing as an example. Most of us aren't going to steal because we know it's wrong. Right? A lot of us won't steal because what will, our, what will our friends think? Some of us up here won't steal because we'll go to jail. And then the few people up here who are not dissuaded by any of these three won't steal because there's a door lock, because there's a firewall, because it's too hard, because the technical measures keep them out. Right? And, and, and I think we in the security community have been much too narrow in our definition of security because we just concern ourselves with this little piece. And it turns out there's a broad array of pressures that are keeping people from stealing. And it's my belief that if we started looking at security from this broader perspective, we will find a lot of other pressures, a lot of other mechanisms that we can use to reduce theft, like that eye experiment. Right, it, it's, common, it's commonly believed, there's a bunch of psychological research on this, that people are less likely to steal from people they know. And, and from people they know as human beings, not necessarily know personally, but if I sort of know you're a person, I'm less likely to steal from you than if I just think of you abstractly. And this, so the same mechanism by which flame wars happen on the internet in ways they wouldn't happen in person because we're more removed from the other people we're, we're screaming at. Where if we were in a room with them, we'd be more polite. So here's an interesting experiment which no one has done. If I went to a bank and said, let's put 
depositors' account holders' photos on their bank websites, on their bank web pages, would that reduce theft? Would that reduce internet fraud? There's a chance it would. It might not be a lot, because we might be mostly dealing with the people for whom, right, up here, that only thing will keep them out are, are, are uh, technical measures. But there's going to be some number of people whom a little more personalization will make them think, that looks like a nice person, I don't want to steal from them. And perhaps that is a low cost, high payoff societal pressure, security mechanism. Maybe we can do that. And I'll bet there are lots of these. eBay reputation systems are a great example. Right? That is a purely reputation-based security measure. We are going to prevent fraud on eBay by having people who have been defrauded say bad things about their fraudsters. Kind of a weird system, but it works pretty well. I mean, sure, there's fraud on eBay, but much less than there would be if there wasn't that system. Right? Low cost, high payoff. And not something that we in our community would natively think of. Right? We would try to think of technical measures that would actively prevent fraud, as opposed to just let people badmouth their uh, badmouth people they don't like. Right? So what's going on here is that individuals are making a cooperate to effect decision. Right? I now will decide should I steal or should I not. And I'm going to balance the, 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 the costs and benefits. Societal pressures, this is why I use the word pressure, is a way society puts its finger on the scales. Right? Evolutionarily, we're going to make you feel bad if you steal. Now you're less likely to do it. Reputationally, you know, your friends aren't going to like you anymore if you steal. You're going to go to jail if you steal. But you're going to have to climb a barbed wire fence and that's hard and you'll tear your pretty pants. Right? All of those things work together. Now, of course, this depends a lot on context. Right? Stealing is a very easy example. There are much more complex examples. But still, I think when we see a security problem, right, when we see a trust issue, how do we enable trust, I want us to think more broadly. I think there's real value there. Because what we're doing in society is finding some optimal balance between cooperators and defectors. And the balance is important. Right? Too many defectors is damaging, too few defectors is costly. So there's a natural rate of defection in any system that's not zero. And society kind of determines that balance. Right? If, there, I don't know, if the murder rate gets too high, everyone says, hey, the murder rate's, get, murder rate's so high, we need to spend more money on police. If the murder rate gets too low, people say, you know, it's really safe out there. Why are we spending so much money on police when we have these other problems? Right? You know, it's sloppy, it changes, it, it depends on, on culture, it depends on time. But society does sort of manage the optimal level of defection. And I think this way of looking at security has enormous explanatory powers. In my book, I talk about terrorism. I talk about the financial crisis of 2008, organized crime, internet crime, looking at it through this lens of societal pressures and trust. And I think it gives a different way of thinking about these problems and thinking about solutions to these problems. Now, I, I'm being very simplistic. You know, now I like to say I've always been a meta, meta, meta guy. And, and in writing this book, I, I, I drew from a lot of different academic disciplines. Uh, psychology, I have a list. Psychology, economics, game theory, I think I mentioned those. Evolutionary biology, neuroscience, philosophy, anthropology, archaeology, law, poli-sci, history, even some theology. I mean, I kind of felt like I was wandering through university, kicking down doors and demanding answers. And it was a lot of fun. I, in the course of writing this, I, no exaggeration, downloaded thousands of academic papers from a variety of these disciplines. And I believe, sort of an aside, that this work would have been impossible without the internet. 
Because I remember when I was in college, these, these papers existed, but they weren't just in different floors of the library, they were in different libraries. And tracking down these tales would have been prohibitively expensive, it would have been hard. Right? Now it's easy. Right? Tell me what the philosophers say about the prisoner's dilemma. Right? Tell me what the archaeologists say about the history of violence in society. And you can do that. And there's a lot of directions to take this research that I think are interesting. And one of the hard things about the book uh, is putting a boundary around it. Because this is very broad. I mean, I've been very simplistic. I'm talking about self-interest versus group interest. There's actually a lot of different groups and many competing interests. Right? The group interest of the black, well, actually, the DEF CON community might not be the same as the group interest of the city of Las Vegas. How do we navigate those? Right? You know, so there are competing group interests. You as a family member versus you as a community member. You as a citizen uh, versus you as an employee of a company. Different aspects of yourself. Right? And there are competing societal pressures. A lot of complications there. There's a really interesting interplay between morals and reputations because they evolve together. They, they interact very deeply. And I, I've, I've read some people who, who say there's no difference if there's one thing. I mean, I found it useful to break it out, but I'm not sure it makes sense to. Uh, the, the whole dealing with institutional pressures, with laws and how society works. Right? What happens when the interests of those in power don't represent the group? Right? A sometimes totalitarian state where there's a dictator in power who's using his power to enrich himself. How does that work? And how these different pressures scale, I think this is really important for us. Right? There's an, each one has a natural scaling mechanism. Right? You know, our morals are much easier engaged for people who are close to us than sort of abstract people halfway across the planet. Reputation is similarly group-oriented. Laws you know, scale differently. Different types of security mechanisms scale differently. So there's in-group and out-group distinctions, uh, you know, local and local versus distant, and how and as society gets more complex, how these scale is important. Uh, how these play out in common groups is real interesting. In, in my book, I have a chapter on organizations in general, how this stuff works in organizations. I have a separate chapter on how this works inside corporations, right, a very special kind of organization. Right, how this works in government entities is a third chapter, another very specialized kind of organization. Right, and there are differences that make a big difference when you're dealing with security inside those organizations or security from those organizations. Right? You know, I've been talking about individuals making cooperate versus defect decisions, but in our society, companies do. Right? A company decides whether they should pay taxes or not. Right? Follow the law, break the law. Right? So a lot of these are talked about in the book. What I want to talk about here and then the last bit before I open for questions is scale. Because scale affects technology. Right? Technology affects scale. Technology affects scale in a lot of different ways. Right? Very broadly speaking, technology affects scale. There's more people, increased complexity, new social systems, new security systems, increased technological intensity, right? how much damage you can do, increased frequency, increased distance. Right? These are all things we're used to dealing on the internet. For a lot of people, this is very strange. And how societal pressures scale matters a lot. And if you think about the balance, again, between cooperators and defectors, what technology, technology does is it changes that balance. Right? Someone, suddenly someone invents gunpowder and it's easier to kill people. Right? Someone suddenly invents buffer overflows and it's easier to attack computer systems. And in response, society has to rebalance. Right? Maybe some new laws or new technologies, maybe some new group norms or some new reputation. Right? It's hard to get this right, but it, it's the sort of thing we, we do all the time. 
So the problem here, and I think we see the problem in our industry a lot, is that attackers have a natural advantage. Right? In this sort of balancing, which is really a biological red queen race, there's a natural advantage to the attacker. One, he has a first mover advantage, and two, Basically, he has a shorter procurement cycle. I said this on the, on, the, on the panel yesterday. Attackers can make use of innovations faster. Right? So you imagine someone invents the motor car and the police says that's a great idea and they come up with a committee to study it and they produce a, a requirements document, an RFP, and they go out for bids and they buy a motor car and they have a training procedure and, and figure out how to use it. Meanwhile, the bank robber says, oh, look, new getaway vehicle. Right? And can use it much faster because there's no inertia. Right? We saw this on the internet. Right? You know, banks get on the internet and s suddenly, like within minutes, there's a new breed of international cyber criminal that's stealing money out of bank accounts. Right? Meanwhile, the police, who have been raised on Agatha Christie novels, <laughs> right, have no freaking clue how to deal with it in a crime. And it took them, what, 10 years to figure it out? And in some ways, they're still figuring it out because the attackers are still innovating. Right? And they're innovating faster. So if you think about it very broadly, this rebalancing, there's a built-in delay. And I'm call this delay a security gap. And we in our society have a natural security gap because of this natural advantage of the attacker. And it's interesting, I think the security gap gets greater if two things are true. Well, actually, if one of two things are true. One, if there's more technology, and two, in times of rapid technological change. And guess what? We are now living in the time of the most technology ever and the greatest rate of technological change ever. So we are now living in the time of the greatest security gap. Right? We are seeing the effects of this technological, of the technological change more and more, especially as security people. This means, right, it's hard to get security right. And what I think is really interesting, we're starting to see our industry recognize that. Surprise the hell out of me, a year and a half ago at RSA, two RSAs ago, I started seeing all of these companies that talked about not how to keep the bad guys out, but what to do after you get attacked. Right, this has a lot of buzzwords. Uh, I hear it called a reactive security or agile security or lean security, but they really all say the same things. We cannot predict, we cannot prevent. The best we can do is to quickly react and recover. And I think there's a lot of wisdom in that. I mean, yes, we're really good at, you know, once an attack gets institutionalized, right? Once spam is a thing. We come up with anti-spam programs. Once viruses are a thing. But it's the next thing we're not going to be able to, to, to predict. Right? There are just too many of them. The attackers innovated too quickly. We need to be agile. We need to be reactive. And I like seeing that in our industry because I think it's much more honest. Because the whole, if you buy my widget, you're magically safe, was never true. Right? The whole, well, you, okay, um, let's be honest with you, you're screwed, buy my widget after the fact. <laughs> That's kind of a plus, I think. Right? You know, but on the other hand, right, technology helps societal pressures too. Right? There's a lot of technological-based security mechanisms. I talk about eBay feedback, uh, Yelp is an example. Uh, you can really argue, and I've had some historians agree with me, that writing that the technology of writing was a way to make moral societal pressure scale. You can take your moral texts and codify them and write them down and transfer them to people. That was a huge technological innovation for security. Right? All sorts of technologies that help laws scale, right? better technology scales. All right, so one more problem I want to leave you with. Society isn't always right. And I've been talking about this group interest versus self-interest. What happens when the group is wrong? And what happens when the group is a, you know, denies women the right to vote? 
enslaves part of its population. Because right? so societal pressures will keep that immoral society. And of course, you know, that's, that's not what I'm talking about. Right? The implicit assumption is always that the group is correct, but that's not always true. Right? Police informants are defectors from the criminal organization. Conscientious objectors are defectors. Civil disobedience is a defector. The 99% movement are defectors. Right? So defectors, and I think this is their essential value in society, is they enable societal change. You know, if we move to a world where music and movies are by default free like television was, it will be because of us as defectors. Because we would look to the social norm and said, this is not right. We did right, the uncooperative thing and eventually society came around to our point of view. And my belief is that's going to happen. Lots of examples of that in society. Right, so too much societal pressure is bad. Too much societal pressure stagnates society. You need defectors because that's where social change comes from. You want to know the value of DEF CON? This is it. The, you know, the IT industry needs DEF CON because otherwise IT is boring. You can tell them I said that. All right, so some final points. One, no matter how much societal pressure you deploy, there always will be defectors. Right? You cannot get your cooperation rate to 100%. And there's great game theory models that, that explain this. Two, increasing societal pressure isn't always worth it. You have diminishing returns. More security isn't always better. Sometimes it's cheaper to have some defection. We all defect at some times and in some things. Nobody is 100% cooperative, even angels. Right? There are good defectors and there are bad defectors, and society can't always tell the difference. Sometimes you need right, the hindsight of history to know whether the defector was morally right or wrong. And last, society needs defectors. 100% right, cooperation isn't a good thing. So with that, I'd like to open this up for questions for about 10 minutes. Then they're going to throw me off the stage. And I have to be cooperative and get off the stage. <laughs> Is there any hand there? Yes. Please. Got to stand up because they're loud. So he's asking about culture. I just want to say for the people who are leaving, after this talk, I'm doing a book signing sort of that way somewhere. So if people want to come in and ask more questions, I'll be there. He asked about culture. Culture is really interesting. Culture, I think of as, it's a combination. This is where our morals and reputation the same or different. Because a lot of culture gets inculcated in our morals. Right? We don't do this because that's not what we do. We eat with a fork and knife and not with our mouths on the plate. 100% right? cultural. And, but that's what cooperative means. So culture has a... Because has a, a, a lot of these pressures are kind of arbitrary. We all drive on the right. Well, there's no reason to, but we all got to do the same thing or it's going to be bad. So culturally we have decided to do that. And yeah, there's some uh, law component, there's some reputation component, some moral component. So culture kind of infuses all of this because culture is where those group norms come from. Right? The culture of black hat is a certain way, which might be different than the culture of another security conference or another conference in general or your family's Thanksgiving dinner. Right? There are things you'll do at one you wouldn't do at the other. Thank heavens. And so culture, I think, is really important. And culture is how we think about these group norms. Hand there. So anonymity on the... No, so I, I'm not saying that all pressures are useful at all times. Right? Reputational pressure you know, is sort of anti-anonymity. 
But there are times when we recognize that anonymity is so important that we say, we're not going to worry about reputational pressures. And, and, that's, and, and that's valuable. Lots of systems use anonymity. You know, the, the, the systems that pr protect my house from burglary have nothing to do with the reputation, basically. Right? It's door locks, it's burglar alarms. You know, I don't care who you are, just don't rob my house. So there are reputational systems that are valuable. Some of them are useful in some circumstances, some aren't. Right? The, in the eBay feedback system is reputational, but it's really about screen names, not about real names. So there are ways to use pseudonymity to separate. Uh, license plates are a really interesting example of a reputational system and a legal system that's somewhat anonymous. I mean, you know, you think about it, we can actually put people's names on the back of their car, but we don't. We put an arbitrary number, we have a database that, that links the numbers to people that we, we have when we make that database limited access. So there are a lot of ways to preserve anonymity and still provide security. I'm, I'm, I'm a big anonymity fan, I'm a big privacy fan. But we do have to recognize that, you know, especially historically, a lot of security came from the fact that your neighbors knew who you were. Especially when objects were, were expensive. Right? If you live in a world where it's hard to make a bowl, right, if someone loses a bowl and you show up with the exact same bowl, everyone knows you stole it. Right? But we live in a society where objects are cheap and, and interchangeable that that sort of, of continuity no longer works for security. So a lot of reputational systems work in small groups. A lot of, uh, of psychological research done on group size, Robin Dunbar's work, and how they have trouble scaling. So a lot of detail there which I kind of sloughed off in the talk, so don't, I don't mean to. See a hand right behind you. You know, this is about the group anonymous. And I, I'm actually kind of a fan of anonymous because it's kind of fun to see. Uh, uh, I think anonymous has done a lot. I mean, it's like the 99% movement in, in some ways. A lot of what they've done is civil disobedience. Right? This system is wrong and we're going to tear it down. And, you know, when they, when they steal things, I'm sort of unhappy. But when they point to unjust systems and say this system is unjust, you know, they're as moral as people who refuse to sit in the back of a bus. Right? This system, even though it's legal, is immoral and I'm not going to follow it. And, and, and some of what they did was like that. Anonymous is a hard group to, to, to talk about in general because it was less a group and more a self-identification moniker. Right? Anybody could say I'm anonymous and do things. But I think there was a lot of social justice, civil disobedience about the movement at a core. And I think that's also why it scared governments in ways that normal cybercrime didn't. Because they weren't just you know, your average hacker. They were a movement with, you know, with something resembling ideals. And they were kind of fun. So they captured people's imaginations, which made them doubly scary. All right, I have to take one more question and get off stage. Yes? You know, I've never liked the PKI model. I mean, I, I think we certainly need models of, you know, a lot of what we try to do is take our existing social systems and move them onto the internet. And, and the system of trusted introducers and, and, and history and reputation, we're trying to take those and somehow put them on the net. And Facebook tries to do that, and eBay tries to do that, and PKI tried to do that, and PGP with its web of trust tried to do that. And these models, they transfer in a flawed way, they're exploitable, but I think they're all valuable. So there are, there are definitely roles for public keys and authentication and certification. I mean, PKI was sold as the savior in net security, and that was never true and it's still not true but it still has a role. The way to always think about this is not to invent new systems, but to take the existing social systems and turn them into, this is, this is a great phrase from Ross Anderson, socio-technical systems. Right? The hard stuff is that mesh of social and technical. Right? And those are the valuable systems, and those are the hard systems to secure. And, and when, when, when we are at our best, we take social security mechanisms to use that and I guess the, the non-euphemism form of that term, 
and make them socio-technical security systems. And that could be a bank certifying your credential to withdraw money. But it's not going to be a global PKI because in the real world there is no global certification system. That's why it doesn't work. Right? Open up your wallet. You'll see a bank card and a driver's license and an airline frequent flyer card and a library card. There's no reason in the world why you can't have one card for all those things. Right? They're just numbers. They're pointers in databases. But you don't. Right? There's no single PKI for the cards in your wallet. Every institution issues its own credentials to you with its own revocation procedures and, and authentication procedures. Right? They're all different. The net looks the same way. So there are roles for PKIs for little ones, but a global PKI never made sense because it didn't match the way the real world worked. So with that I'm going to end. Uh, I have uh, so there are copies of my book for sale at the bookstore. Uh, this is it. Uh, this is the book flyer. I mean, it's the free version of the book. It's a lot thinner, <laughs> but it has far fewer words, so it's easy to read. Right there are flyers there and there. I'll be here for a bit. Then I'm going to walk over to the book signing. And even if you don't buy a book, stop by and say hi. I'm happy to, to, to chat and take questions. Thanks for coming. Uh, enjoy Black Hat, and I'll see you at DEF CON. I'm